Today is day one for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 16th to the 22nd. First and second Thessalonians, perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Monday, October 16th, 2023, First Thessalonians 1. Seek revelation daily. Revelation often comes line upon line, not all at once. Don't think of gospel study as something you make time for, but as something you are always doing. If we do not record the impressions we receive from the Spirit, we might forget them. What does the Spirit prompt you to record as you read First and Second Thessalonians? Those who follow the living prophets are prepared for Christ's second coming. Early in his second missionary journey, Paul came to Thessalonica. What richness of experience and feeling must be hidden in Luke's simple lines about that visit. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them the Jewish synagogue in Thessalonica, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. This was the Paul, whose itinerary and route had twice been changed by the influence of the Holy Spirit to bring him directly to Macedonia. This is the Paul who had been grieved by the tauntings of a young Philippian girl possessed of an evil spirit, and had turned and cast the evil spirit from her. This was the Paul who, though it was midnight and his feet were clamped in prison stocks and his back was torn and bloody from the repeated blows of the lash, sang hymns of praise to God. The apostle who bore witness to the Thessalonians of Christ's power to deliver from sin was the apostle who had in Philippi witnessed doors fly open and chains break free with the quaking of the earth. The missionary who came to Thessalonica to baptize was the missionary who ignored the miraculous chance for freedom provided by the earthquake and instead stayed to baptize the terrified jailer. These were the experiences fresh upon the mind of the apostle as he came to the Thessalonians with the message of Christ. How precious it would be if a record of Paul's sermons on those three consecutive Sabbaths had been preserved. We know that he spoke to his listeners of Christ, but one cannot help but wonder what questions he asked, what stories he related, what scriptures he quoted. Certainly he discussed the future return of the Savior, for when he was driven from the city by angry Jews and wrote letters back to his converts, this theme ran heavily through them. As you read these two letters, remember the words of President Brigham Young when he asked this question. Are you prepared for the day of vengeance to come, when the Lord will consume the wicked by the brightness of his coming? No, then do not be too anxious for the Lord to hasten his work. Let our anxiety be centered upon this one thing, the sanctification of our own hearts, the purifying of our own affections, the preparing of ourselves for the approach of the events that are hastening upon us. This should be our concern. This should be our study. This should be our daily prayer. Seek to have the Spirit of Christ, that we may wait patiently the time of the Lord and prepare ourselves for the times that are coming. This is our duty. Paul and his missionary companions found success preaching to the people in Thessalonica, but were ultimately forced out of the city by detractors. Sometime after they left, Paul learned that the Thessalonian saints had remained faithful and were sharing the gospel message with others. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul reiterated his sincere devotion to God and to teaching the gospel. He also responded to the Thessalonian saints' concerns regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ. Paul later wrote a second letter to the Thessalonian saints when he learned that false ideas about the coming of Jesus Christ were continuing to cause concern. 1 Thessalonians is believed to be the earliest of Paul's existing epistles. In fact, it is probably the oldest book in the New Testament, having been written more than a decade before any of the Gospels. Paul's teachings in the first epistle to the Thessalonians are primarily focused on the second coming of Jesus Christ, including the hardships that followers of Jesus Christ will face before Christ's return, the resurrection of Christians at the second coming, and the timing of Christ's coming. Paul mentioned the second coming in every chapter of First Thessalonians. These teachings are especially valuable to Latter-day Saints, who live in the dispensation in which the Lord has said, The time of my coming is nigh at hand. The greeting in First Thessalonians 1.1 states that the epistle was sent by Paul, Silvanus or Silas, 
and Timotheus or Timothy. All three of these men had labored together in Thessalonica in modern-day Greece during Paul's second missionary journey. Although Silas and Timothy may have contributed to the writing of the, this epistle to the Thessalonians, the use of I in several verses suggests that Paul was personally responsible for the content. During his second missionary journey, about 51 AD, Paul had labored with Silas and Timothy in T Thessalonica. The three men were forced out of the city by Jewish leaders. Paul later sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to give support and encouragement to church members there. Later, Timothy reported to Paul at Corinth that the Thessalonian saints had remained faithful despite persecution and that their righteous influence was spreading. It is likely that Paul wrote his first epistle to the Thessalonians shortly after he received this news in about 52 AD. Evidence suggests that 1 Thessalonians was written from Corinth. Since both Silas and Timothy contributed to the writing of these epistles, this letter could only have been written after Silas and Timothy had joined Paul in Corinth. During Paul's second missionary journey, the Spirit directed Paul and his companions, Silas, Timothy, and perhaps Luke, to travel across the Aegean Sea into Macedonia. This divinely guided change in their itinerary initiated the preaching of the gospel in Europe. After preaching in Philippi, Paul and Silas traveled to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was the most populous and prosperous city in the ancient Greek kingdom of Macedonia because of two important features. The city was built on the best natural harbor in the Aegean Sea, and it was located on the major highway that connected Rome and modern-day Turkey. Paul commenced preaching the message of Jesus Christ at the city's Jewish synagogue, and many Jews and God-fearing Gentiles accepted the gospel. The three men were therefore forced out of the city by Jewish leaders. The Thessalonian converts were some of the first Europeans to embrace the gospel, and they faced persecution as a result. They also had many questions about the second coming, perhaps because they were looking forward to a better time with less persecution. Therefore, in his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote words of encouragement and strength, and he addressed their questions about the second coming of Jesus Christ. One of Paul's main themes in this first epistle to the Thessalonians is the second coming. He focused not on the destruction of the wicked, but on the participation of the righteous at Jesus Christ's coming, especially those saints who had died previously. Paul illustrated the nature of the Godhead in various passages that refer to God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Also, unlike many of Paul's other epistles, 1 Thessalonians does not contain any major rebukes or corrections but instead offers praise and commendation for the Thessalonian saints. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Many doors of gospel investigation are open to Paul in this first epistle to the Thessalonians. Supposed to be one of his earliest writings, he takes occasion in it to remind his beloved associates in Thessalonica of the coming of our Lord, of the power resident of his gospel, of how diligent they must be in walking as becometh saints, and of summarizing many church and ministerial duties. His explanations relative to the second coming contain what is probably the best approach in any inspired writing to an interpretation of when the signs of the times shall be fulfilled. In Thessalonica, Paul and Silas were accused of having turned the world upside down. Their preaching angered certain leaders among the Jews, and these leaders stirred the people into an uproar. As a result, Paul and Silas were advised to leave Thessalonica Paul worried about the new Thessalonian converts and the persecution they were facing, but he was unable to return to visit them. When I could no longer forbear, he wrote, I sent to know your faith. In response, Paul's assistant Timothy, who had been serving in Thessalonica, brought us good tidings of your faith and charity. In fact, the Thessalonian saints were known as examples to all that believe, and news of their faith spread to cities abroad. Imagine Paul's joy and relief to hear that his work among them was not in vain. Paul knew that faithfulness in the past is not sufficient for spiritual survival in the future. And he was weary of the influence of false teachers among the saints. His message to them and to us is to continue to perfect that which is lacking in our faith and to increase more and more in love. Paul expressed great appreciation for the saints in Thessalonica and commended them for their efforts to spread the gospel. He reminded his readers of his kindly ministry among them and expressed joy for their faithfulness. He reminded the saints to grow in love toward one another and toward all men. 
In 1 Thessalonians, Paul's words reveal both the concern and the joy of someone who has given himself wholly to serving God's children. Especially in the first chapters of 1 Thessalonians, you will find words and phrases that describe the attitudes and actions of a disciple of the Lord. Gospel comes in word and power. 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, servants of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, unto the church of the Thessalonians, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Silvanus is another form of the name Silas. This man is thought to be the same who accompanied Paul in the second missionary journey. Timotheus is Timothy. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2-5 We give thanks always, making mention of you all in our prayers to God for you, remembering without ceasing your faith in God and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God or beloved of God, your election. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to much assurance, said, Much testimony, repeated promptings from this Holy Spirit that the gospel is true, and consists of such and such things. After he greeted the Thessalonian saints, Paul reminded them that during his mission among them, he had preached the gospel, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. Concerning the significance of the gospel being taught in both word and power, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, The true gospel consists of two things, the word and the power. Anyone can have the word. The books in which it is written are universally available. But the power must come from God. It is and must be dispensed according to his mind and his will to those who abide the law entitling them to receive it. The word of the gospel is the spoken or written account of what men must do to be saved. The word is in the Bible and in the Doctrine and Covenants and in the Book of Mormon. Our revelations say that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, meaning that it contains a record of God's dealings with the people who had the fullness of the gospel, meaning that in it, is recorded the things men must do to be saved, meaning that it contains a summary of what the plan of salvation is. If men will do what the Book of Mormon counsels, they will be saved in the celestial heaven. The same is true of the Bible and of the Doctrine and Covenants. But actual salvation comes only when the power of God is received and used, and this power is the power of the priesthood and the power of the Holy Ghost. These must operate in the lives of men. Otherwise, their souls cannot be cleansed. They cannot be born again. They cannot become new creatures of the Holy Ghost. They cannot put off the natural man and become saints. They cannot be sanctified by the Spirit. In this sense, the gospel cannot be written except in the bones and sinews and tissues of a human body. When it is so written, the record is then found in the book of life of the converted believer. And it will be out of what is written in the, this book of life that men shall be judged. Anyone can claim to have the gospel and can, in fact, have it in the intellectual sense of knowing what the doctrines of salvation are. But only those who receive the power of God into their lives have the fullness of the gospel. They only are candidates for salvation. To identify this power, God has ordained that certain signs and gifts shall follow those that believe. By faith, they cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, work miracles, gain testimonies, receive revelations, entertain angels, and view the visions of eternity. Where these signs are, there is the power of the gospel, and where the power is, there is the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Elder David M. McConkie said, Paul tells us that the gospel comes to men in two ways, in word and in power. The word of the gospel is written in the scriptures, and we can obtain the word by diligently seeking. The power of the gospel comes into the lives of those who so live that the Holy Ghost is their companion and who follow the promptings they receive. Some focus their attention only on obtaining the word, and they become experts in delivering information. Others neglect their preparation and hope that the Lord, in his goodness, will somehow help them get through the class period. 
You cannot expect the Spirit to help you remember the scriptures and principles you have not studied or considered. In order to successfully teach the gospel, you must have both the word and power of the gospel in your life. 1 Thessalonians 1 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to receive the word of the Holy Ghost, said, No one ever receives the gospel until he gains a revelation from the Holy Ghost. The gospel is a spiritual matter and comes only by the power of the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 1 7 through 8. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. What do you learn from 1 Thessalonians 1, 5-8 about serving the Lord? 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Paul wrote that the converted Thessalonian saints had become examples to non-believers around them. He commended their efforts to spread the gospel, saying, In every place your faith is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. The Thessalonian members were such effective missionaries that Paul and his companions did not feel a need to return to preach in the area. Elder Joseph B. Worthland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles used 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, and 6 to explain the connection between one's personal conversion and one's desire to share the gospel. Paul rejoiced in the fact that what he had told the Thessalonians was not meaningless words to them, for they had listened with great interest, and what was taught them produced a powerful desire for righteousness in their lives. Paul was pleased that the gospel message had been received with such joy and happiness despite many hardships. Finally, he noted what must have been their crowning achievement, that they were inspiring examples to all their neighbors, and that from them the word of the Lord had extended to others everywhere, far beyond their boundaries. Paul paid tribute to them when he told them that wherever he traveled, he found people telling him about their remarkable good works and faith in God. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivereth us from the wrath to come. The prophet Joseph Smith said, It seems to be deeply impressed upon our minds that the saints ought to lay hold on every door that shall seem to be opened unto them, to obtain foothold on the earth, and be making all the preparation that is within their power for the terrible storms that are now gathering in the heavens. A day of clouds, with darkness and gloominess, and of thick darkness as spoken of by the prophets, which cannot be now of a long time lingering. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the wrath to come, said, The gospel is to prepare the saints for the hour of judgment which is to come, that their souls may escape the wrath of God, the desolation of abomination which awaits the wicked, both in this world and in the world to come. Timothy apparently took word to Paul that the Thessalonian saints had questions about the second coming of Jesus Christ, for Paul mentioned the second coming in each chapter of First Thessalonians. Paul sought to help the saints recognize that the Lord's return would be a time of deliverance, hope, and rejoicing for the righteous saints, both living and dead. The second coming will also be accompanied by the destruction of the wicked, the wrath to come, from which the righteous will be delivered. Joseph Smith, Matthew 1, 4, indicates that when the Savior comes again, it will be the end of the world or the destruction of the wicked. Today is day two for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 16th to the 22nd. First and second Thessalonians, perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Tuesday, October 17th, 2023, First Thessalonians 2 and 3. True ministers preach in a godly manner. Brother David L. Beck, former young men general president, said, To minister means to love and to care for others. It means to attend to their physical and spiritual needs. Put simply, it means to do what the Savior would do if he were here.
In 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, Paul spoke about his earlier ministry in Thessalonica. Paul's language in these verses might suggest that detractors in Thessalonica were questioning Paul's sincerity and motivations during his ministry in the city. Paul defended himself by describing the sincere and earnest manner in which he and his companions had taught and served the saints. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency related a personal experience that helped him learn the importance of love as we serve and minister to others. The most effective missionaries, member and full-time, always act out of love. I learned this lesson as a young man. I was assigned to visit a less active member, a successful professional many years older than I. Looking back on my actions, I realized that I had very little loving concern for the man I visited. I acted out of duty, with a desire to report 100% on my home teaching. One evening, close to the end of the month, I phoned to ask if my companion and I could come right over and visit him. His chastening reply taught me an unforgettable lesson. No, I don't believe I want you to come over this evening, he said. I'm tired. I've already dressed for bed. I am reading, and I am just not willing to be interrupted so that you can report 100% on your home teaching this month. That reply still stings me because I know he had sensed my selfish motivation. I hope no person we approach with an invitation to hear the message of the restored gospel feels that we are acting out of any reason other than a genuine love for them and an unselfish desire to share something we know to be precious. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said the manner in which the Lord's ministers carry their message to the world is one of the great identifying characteristics of the truth. Paul here recites the valiance and devotion, the uprightness and gentleness, the fairness and holiness that attended his missionary efforts and those of his companions. He and they manifest the same spirit and course which the Lord set for his latter-day ministers in these words. No one can assist in the work except he shall be humble and full of love, having faith, hope, and charity, being temperate in all things whatsoever shall be entrusted in his care. Contrast this Christ-like preaching of the word with the forced spread of an apostate religion through civil war in England, through the Inquisition in Spain, through the sale of indulgences in all Europe, through the sword of Cortes in Mexico, and so on. 1 Thessalonians 2, 1-2 for yourselves, brethren, know your entrance is unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that ye had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as ye know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Paul wrote that he and his missionary companions had preached the gospel to the Thessalonians with much contention. This phrase does not mean that Paul was contentious or argumentative in his preaching. Instead, it implies that he taught the gospel in the face of contention and opposition. In Thessalonica, resistance to the gospel message came from both antagonistic Jews and Gentiles. Missionaries today inevitably face similar trials, but those who continue to preach despite opposition find, as did Paul, that their work is not in vain. It has been suggested that the word contention in verse 2 ought to translate from the Greek as conflict, referring to any struggle outward or inward. Sometimes the word opposition is used in place of contention. Whichever interpretation is used, what seems to be clear is the fact that Paul was able to preach the gospel only by enduring much conflict in antagonistic Jews and Gentiles, by struggling mightily with mental trials, and by experiencing great hardships. Like Paul, missionaries today must endure much hardship and opposition. Antagonistic non-members, self and devil impose doubt and temptation, and even physical and financial hardships. And like Paul, missionaries today overcome and endure in the same way, by perseverance born of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3-9 For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed, or approved, or found worthy, or chosen of God, to be put in trust, or trusted, with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts, or examines or proves by trial. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, 
when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, or toil, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable or burdensome unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to with much contention, laboring day and night, quoted D&C 112.5. Contend thou therefore morning by morning, and day after day, let thy warning voice go forth. And when the night cometh, let not the inhabitants of the earth slumber because of thy speech. 1 Thessalonians 2, 10-12 Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to God hath called you unto his kingdom and glory, said, You were foreordained to join the church and to receive eternal life. What if I am not sure how to minister to others? Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles pointed out, A person with a good heart can help someone fix a tire, take a roommate to the doctor, have lunch with someone who is sad, or smile and say hello to brighten a day. But a follower of the first commandment who loves God with all his heart will naturally add to these important acts of service by encouraging the person who is doing well and keeping the commandments and sharing wise counsel to strengthen the faith of someone who is slipping or who needs help in moving back onto the path he once traveled. Bishop W. Christopher Waddell of the presiding bishopric stated, We may wonder how best to serve, but the Lord knows, and through his Spirit, we will be directed in our efforts, as we strive to become instruments in the Lord's hands to bless his children. As we seek the guidance of the Spirit and trust the Lord, we will be placed in situations and circumstances where we can act and bless, in other words, minister. Converts are the glory and joy of missionaries. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, No man can conceive how great is the worth of souls. One soul saved, which would have been lost, means added kingdoms and worlds, added spirit children born of exalted beings, added hosts of intelligent beings going forward everlastingly in eternal progression. Is it any wonder that Paul gloried and rejoiced in his converts? Is it any wonder that the Lord himself said, and if it so be that ye should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be, one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father! And now, if your joy will be great with one soul that ye have brought unto me into the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if ye should bring many souls unto me! First Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. What caused so many Thessalonians to become converted when Paul and his companions taught the gospel message to them? What evidence in these verses suggests that they were truly converted to the gospel? What do you learn from 1 Thessalonians 2, 1-13 about serving the Lord? 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 For ye, brethren, became believers or imitators of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Elder Bruce R. McConkie referring to churches of God in Christ Jesus said, Congregation of God's people comprising the church of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, 15-16 Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to wrath is come upon them to the uttermost, said, 
Soon the Jews, incident to the destruction of Jerusalem as a nation and as a people, were to suffer much tribulation and desolation as never before or since have ever befallen their house. Why should the Jews seek to prevent the spread of the gospel, not alone among themselves and their kindred, but among the Gentiles also? Is not this very manifestation of hatred and venom an evidence of the divinity of the work? How could so much hatred and bitterness against the truth be kept alive unless Satan was stirring them up, using persecution as a tool to fight the truth? 1 Thessalonians 2, 13-18 but we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoring the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Therefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Paul had not been back to Thessalonica after he was driven out during his second missionary journey. He said he had been unable to return because he was hindered by Satan from doing so. He did not give any details about how Satan hindered him from returning to Thessalonica, but it is clear that persecution from Jews had already forced Paul to take many detours in his journey. Concerning opposition to the Lord's servants, President Howard W. Hunter noted, Satan is always present and will do everything he can to hinder and block and defeat. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19-20 For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Think about your own opportunities to serve God and his children. What did you find in these chapters that inspires you to improve your service? Consider asking yourself questions based on what you found such as, am I an example of the things I know? Perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Elder Bruiser McConkie said, when co converts, as we are pleased to call them, join the church, they thereby go on the path leading to eternal life. Before entering the gate of repentance and baptism to start their course toward salvation, they gain a testimony of the truth and divinity of the work. But after joining the church, they must press forward until they are converted in the full sense, until they are sanctified in Christ, until they become inheritors of all things. Hence Paul's counsel to members of the church to perfect that which is lacking in their faith. By way of illustration, this means that those who believe in part must give their whole hearts to the Lord. Those whose minds are yet entangled in false educational philosophies must purge their thinking. Those who give lip service must now serve with all their might, mind, and strength. Those who are lukewarm must reach the boiling point. Those with a meager knowledge of the doctrines of eternal truth must treasure up the words of life. When faith is perfected, salvation is assured. 1 Thessalonians 3, 1-3 Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved or disturbed or perturbed by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Doctrine and Covenants 136.31 My people must be tried in all things, that they may be prepared to receive the glory that I have for them, even the glory of Zion, and he that will not bear chastisement is not worthy of my kingdom. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, One's life, therefore, cannot be both faith-filled and stress-free. President Wilford Woodruff counseled us all about the mercy that is inherent in some adversity. The chastisements we have had from time to time have been for our good and are essential to learn wisdom and carry us through a school of experience we never could have passed through without. We are told not to despise or resent, therefore, the chastising of the Lord. Paul said, My son, despise not thou the chastising of the Lord, nor fate when thou art rebuked of him, but further observed, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. 
No wonder we must have eternal perspective to endure chastening, because there would seem to be little pleasure or joy in it, and sometimes virtually no immediate understanding of why. But later, later, for we so often get our witness only after the trial of our faith. It was a marvelous Job who said, Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will not offend any more. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4 For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Christ's ministers are appointed to suffer persecution and affliction. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5 For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted or put to trial or test you, and your labor be in vain. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, The tempter is Satan. 1 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 8 but now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to stand fast in the Lord, said, Keep the commandments, endure to the end, live the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 3, nine, But what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Paul rejoiced in the faithfulness of the Thessalonian saints, but he also wanted them to abound more and more in that faithfulness. As you read 1 Thessalonians 3, 7-13 and 4, 1-12, ponder ways you can increase more and more spiritually. For example, notice that Paul used words, like holiness and sanctification. In the guide to the scriptures, it says, Holy is sacred, having a holy character, or spiritually and morally pure. The opposite of holy is common or profane. And sanctification says, The process of becoming free from sin, pure, clean, and holy through the atonement of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 3.10 Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, Serving, studying, praying, and worshiping are four fundamentals in perfecting that which is lacking in our faith. If we cease nurturing our faith in any of these four specific ways, we are vulnerable. Increasing our faith, therefore, requires decreasing one by one whatever our personal equivocations, reservations, and hesitations are in each of the specific dimensions of faith. Those spiritual weaknesses that impede our finally surrendering to the Lord in full faith. By so doing, we perfect that which is lacking in our faith. With little faith, for example, we may actually acknowledge God's past blessings, but still fear that he will not deliver us in a present situation. Or we may trust that God will finally deliver us, but fear that he will do so only after a severe trial, which we desperately do not want. Such a severe trial may have been in God's plans all along, but it certainly is not in ours. We don't like negative surprises. 1 Thessalonians 3, 11-13 Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end ye may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Sister Carol F. McConkie said, Holiness is in the striving and the struggle to keep the commandments and to honor the covenants we have made with God. Holiness is making the choices that will keep the Holy Ghost as our guide. Holiness is setting aside our natural tendencies and becoming a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. Every moment of our lives must be holiness to the Lord. What impresses you about the feelings Paul had for his friends? How can we increase and abound in love one toward another?
Today is day three for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 16th to the 22nd. First and Second Thessalonians, perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Wednesday, October 18th, 2023, First Thessalonians 4 and 5, 1 through 11. Paul told the saints to be holy and to sanctify themselves. He explained that when the Lord comes again, saints who are faithful in their testimony of Christ will be resurrected and appear with the Savior at the time of his second coming. And the righteous living on earth at that day will meet the Lord and the risen saints. Paul reminded church members to prepare and watch for the day of Christ's coming. Be holy, sanctify yourselves. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Paul was very pleased with Timothy's report of good tidings of faith and charity among church members in Thessalonica. Nevertheless, Paul reminded the saints that discipleship required consistent growth and improvement. He encouraged them to increase and abound in love one toward another, to abound more and more in their efforts to please God and to increase more and more in love. A similar principle was taught by Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles when he stated that discipleship is to be lived in crescendo. President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency spoke about the increased need for continuous spiritual growth in the latter days. As the forces around us increase in intensity, Whatever spiritual strength was once sufficient will not be enough, and whatever growth in spiritual strength we once thought was possible, greater growth will be made available to us. Both the need for spiritual strength and the opportunity to acquire it will increase at rates which we underestimate at our peril. 1 Thessalonians 4.2 For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Keep the commandments. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye would abstain from fornication. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to sanctification, said, To be sanctified is to become clean, pure, and spotless, to be free from the blood and sins of the world, to become a new creature of the Holy Ghost, one whose body has been renewed by the rebirth of the Spirit. Sanctification is a state of saintliness a state attained only by conformity to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The plan of salvation is the system and means provided whereby men may sanctify their souls and thereby become worthy of a celestial inheritance. Sanctification is a basic doctrine of the gospel. Indeed, the very reason men are commanded to believe, repent, and be baptized is so that they may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost and thereby being able to stand spotless before the judgment bar of Christ. Moroni summarized the plan of salvation in these words, Come unto Christ, and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God, and again, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that ye become holy without spot. First Thessalonians 4.4 4, That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Elder Bruce R. McConkie referring to possess his vessel in sanctification said, possess his body in holiness. The word vessel in this passage has been interpreted to mean body. Men and women are to control their bodies, to respect their bodies as temples of God, and to treat them with honor. They are not to use them as instruments for lustful self-gratification. 1 Thessalonians 4.5 Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. In Paul's day, sexual relations outside of marriage were tolerated and accepted by many Gentiles. Since most of the new members of the church in Thessalonica were Gentile converts who had turned to God from idols, Peter felt the need to strengthen their understanding of gospel principles regarding chastity. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3-5, Paul helped these members understand that as members of Christ's church, 
they should abstain from fornication, possess their vessel or control their bodies, and choose not to give in to lust of concupiscence or lustful passions. Concerning the Lord's standard of sexual purity, Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles stated, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a single, undeviating standard of sexual morality. Intimate relations are proper only between a man and a woman in the marriage relationship prescribed in God's plan. Such relations are not merely a curiosity to be explored, an appetite to be satisfied, or a type of recreation or entertainment to be pursued selfishly. They are not a conquest to be achieved, or simply an act to be performed. Rather, they are in mortality, one of the ultimate expressions of our divine nature and potential, and a way of strengthening emotional and spiritual bonds between husband and wife. We are agents blessed with moral agency and are defined by our divine heritage as children of God and not by sexual behaviors, contemporary attitudes, or secular philosophies. 1 Thessalonians 4, 6 That no man go beyond and defraud or take advantage of a wrong his brother in any matter or the matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the Lord is the avenger of all such, said, The Lord will heap vengeance upon those who commit sex sin. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Elder Bruce R. McConkie quoted Leviticus 19.2, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 1 Thessalonians 4.8, He therefore that despiseth, or rejects, or sets aside, or violates, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Paul told the Thessalonian saints, God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Since the time of the Old Testament, God's people have been commanded to separate themselves from unholy and unclean things. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency explained that personal holiness comes through the combination of our efforts and God's work of purifying our hearts. Holiness comes by faith and through obedience to God's laws and ordinances. God then purifies the heart by faith, and the heart becomes purged from that which is profane and unworthy. Work with your own hands. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9-11 through 11. And as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study, or strive, or endeavor earnestly, to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to be quiet, said, avoid disturbances. And referring to do your own business, said, don't meddle in other people's affairs. And in referring to work with your own hands, said, Paul was a tent maker, Peter a fisherman, Adam farmed, David herded sheep, Brigham Young was a glazer, Jesus a carpenter. Labor is a part of life. Physical work is honorable. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. Every man should labor physically as well as mentally. How would Paul's counsel in these verses help you invite the Holy Ghost more into your life? When do you build quiet time into your busy life? What benefits do you find in quiet, reflective times? 1 Thessalonians 4.12 That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. In 1 Thessalonians 4.10, Paul counseled the saints to increase more and more in their love toward one another. He encouraged them to endeavor to lead a quiet life, to not meddle in the affairs of others, to work with their own hands and avoid dependency on others, and to be honest. Concerning the idea of living a quiet life, Elder Bruce D. Porter of the Seventy taught, Personal prayer, study, and pondering are vital to the building up of the kingdom within our own souls. It is in quiet moments of contemplation and communion with the Almighty that we come to know and love Him as our Father. What do you learn from Paul's writings about the meanings of these words? Holy and sanctification. 
How can the Savior help you become more holy and sanctified? Saints saved at second coming. The Thessalonian Christians were apparently concerned about the fate of deceased church members. They wondered when the righteous dead would be resurrected and whether they would have part in the second coming. Paul told the saints to sorrow not for the dead, as do others which have no hope. He assured the Thessalonians that the righteous saints, which sleep in Jesus, will take part in the second coming along with the living. These will God bring with him at his second coming. Elsewhere in his epistles to the Thessalonians, Paul used the Greek word parousia to refer to the second coming. Parousia could refer to the arrival of any person, but it was often used to describe the arrival of a ruler or emperor. In the Greco-Roman world, the arrival or visit of the emperor was anticipated with extensive preparation. Paul's use of this word helped him stress the importance of proper preparation for Jesus Christ's return to earth. Paul's portrayal of the second coming of Jesus Christ is confirmed in modern revelation. President Dallin H. Oaks summed up Latter-day teachings about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Four matters are indisputable to Latter-day Saints. One, the Savior will return to the earth in power and great glory to reign personally during a millennium of righteousness and peace. Two, at the time of his coming, there will be a destruction of the wicked and a resurrection of the righteous. Three, no one knows the time of his coming. But four, the faithful are taught to study the signs of it and to be prepared for it. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Salvation is given the saints, all of them, both the living and the dead, at the second coming. The living are caught up to meet their returning Lord, and with him they shall return to live on this earth which will then be changed and receive its paradisiacal glory. When the living arrive at the age of a tree, a hundred years, they shall be changed from mortality to immortality in the twinkling of an eye and shall then reign as kings and priests in exalted glory. Also at our Lord's return, the righteous dead will come forth from their graves with celestial bodies to meet their God. Then they, as kings and priests, shall live and reign with Christ on earth in resurrected glory for a thousand years. Thus the saints, whether they sleep in the Lord or live in the flesh until he comes, shall inherit glory and honor and salvation at his coming. The formal, shall we even say ritualistic judgment, when all stand before his bar, shall not take place until after the millennium, after all have come forth from their graves. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to them which are asleep and which sleep in Jesus, said, The righteous saints who have died, whose spirits are in the paradise of God, awaiting the day of a glorious resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14-16 And if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then so they also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive at the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or proceed or make progress over them who remain unto the coming of the Lord which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, or a cry of command, or a cheer, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall arise first. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the dead in Christ, shall rise first, said, The righteous dead shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. Wicked men shall rise second in the resurrection of the unjust. The catching up of the living saints shall take place at the same time the righteous dead are resurrected. The Joseph Smith translation for 1 Thessalonians 4.17 reads, Then they who are alive shall be caught up together into the clouds, with them who remain to meet their Lord in the air, and so shall we be ever with the Lord. Many Christians use the word rapture from a Latin term meaning caught up when referring to the term when the righteous will be caught up to meet the Savior at his coming. Elder Bruce R. McConkie quoted D&C 2913 and D&C 88, 96 through 98. A trump shall sound both long and loud, even as upon Mount Sinai, and all the earth shall quake, and they shall come forth, yea, even the dead which died in me, 
to receive a crown of righteousness and to be clothed upon even as i am to be with me that we may be one and the saints that are upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened and be caught up to meet him and they who have slept in their graves shall come forth for their graves shall be opened and they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven they are christ's the first fruits they who shall descend with him first and they who are on the earth and in their graves who are caught up to meet him and all this by the voice of the sounding of the trump of the angel of god first thessalonians four eighteen, wherefore comfort one another with these words what phrases in these verses about the resurrection give you comfort saints know the season of second coming in first thessalonians 5 1 through 10 paul used several metaphors to teach about the time when jesus will return to the earth as you study these metaphors consider writing down the impressions that come to you about the second coming of the savior a thief in the night travail upon a woman with child and other metaphors you find first thessalonians 5 1 but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to times and seasons, said age or era or generation in which Christ shall come. Paul next compared the second coming of Christ to the unexpected arrival of a thief, a comparison earlier used by Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.2 For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to as a thief in the knife, said unexpectedly or without warning. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, I do not know when he is going to come. No man knows. Even the angels of heaven are in the dark in regard to that great truth. But this I know, that the signs that have been pointed out are here. The earth is full of calamity or trouble. The hearts of men are failing them. We see the signs as we see the fig tree putting forth her leaves. And knowing this time is near, it behooves you and all men upon the face of the earth to pay heed to the words of Christ, to his apostles, and watch, for we know not the day nor the hour. But I tell you this, it shall come as a thief in the night, when many of us will not be ready for it. Paul compares the coming of the Lord to the coming of a thief in the night. In other words, it will come unexpectedly and without warning. But the effect it will have on people will vary because there are two basically different classes of people. Continuing the analogy of night and day, Paul titles these two classes as follows. The children of the night, these are the people of the world who dwell in darkness. Therefore, they will not see the signs which herald the approach of this great event. The day of the Lord shall be a dreadful day for them. The children of the day, these are those who dwell in light and truth. They see the warning signs and therefore are spiritually prepared for the coming of Jesus. For them, the day of the Lord shall be a great day. Paul does not further describe or discuss the children of the night, for it takes no special preparation or qualification to be classed as one of these. But he defines clearly how a person may become a child of the day. Those who are the children of the day will be sober. That is, they will recognize the deeply serious nature of life and the need for spiritual preparation. They will let the solemnities of eternity rest upon their minds. Children of the day will also clothe themselves in three great attributes, namely faith, love, and the hope of salvation. In addition, they will strive to improve their relationships with both God and man. Paul lists seven specific ways to do both. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Paul told the Thessalonians that the coming of the Lord would be as travail upon a woman with child, that where people of the world are concerned, Jesus would come as a thief in the night, that is, unexpectedly and without warning, but that where the children of light are concerned, the Lord would not come as a thief in the night, for they are aware of the times and seasons connected with his return. Thus, though the saints do not know the day, they are aware of the season. As a woman in travail 
feels the pains of the approaching birth, so the saints read the signs of the times. Neither knows the exact moment of the anticipated happening, but both know the approximate time. First Thessalonians 5, 4-5 through And ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. Ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. Paul taught that because the followers of Jesus Christ are not in darkness, they will not be caught off guard by the Lord's return. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the children of light, said, Members of the church of Jesus Christ, those who have forsaken the world and come unto the light of the gospel, those who enjoy the gift and guidance of the Holy Ghost, those who can read the signs of the times. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6-8 Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, or vigilant or circumspect. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to breastplate and helmet, said, Part of the armor of God considered in Ephesians six ten through 24 Paul compared the disciples of Jesus Christ to a sober person who is awake and alert. These disciples are unimpaired by the drunkenness of worldly living that prevents the wicked from recognizing the nearness of the Lord's coming. In modern day scripture, the Lord has taught, and again, verily, I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore, gird up your loins, that you may be the children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief. To read more about the importance of not waiting to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ, see the commentary for Joseph Smith Matthew 1, 46-54 and Matthew 24, 42-51. As recorded in Matthew 24, 42-51, the Savior taught his disciples to be watchful and ready for his coming. In modern revelation, we are told that if we are prepared, we need not fear. President Dallin H. Oaks encouraged us to be prepared always for his second coming. While we are powerless to alter the fact of the second coming and unable to know its exact time, we can accelerate our own preparation and try to influence the preparation of those around us. What if the day of his coming were tomorrow? What if we knew that we would meet the Lord tomorrow, through our premature death or through his unexpected coming? What would we do today? What confessions would we make? What practices would we discontinue? What accounts would we settle? What forgiveness would we extend? What testimonies would we bear? If we would do those things then, why not now? Why not seek peace while peace can be obtained? If our lamps of preparation are drawn down, let us start immediately to replenish them. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9-10 For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to Christ died for us, said salvation comes because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Wherefore, comfort, or exhort, or console, or encourage yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, Question, Does or will anyone know when the Lord will come? Answer, As to the day and hour, no. As to the generation, yes. Question, who shall know the generation? Answer. The saints, the children of light, those who can read the signs of the times, those who treasure up the Lord's word so they will not be deceived will know the generation. Do we know when Christ shall come again to take vengeance on the ungodly and to reign on earth in love and peace for the space of a thousand years? It is generally assumed that we do not have any such information as this, that such has not and will not be revealed. The fact is, we do know, that is, we know in general when his coming shall be. We do not know the day nor the hour, and for that matter, neither do the angels of God in heaven. But we do know the time and the season, that is, we know the approximate time, shall we say, the generation of his return. Paul's illustration here is perfect. The second coming is compared to a woman about to give birth to a child. She does not know the hour or the minute of the child's arrival, but she does know the approximate time. 
There are signs which precede and presage the promised arrival, and so it is with our Lord's coming. He shall come as a thief in the night, unexpectedly and without warning, to the world, and to those who are in spiritual darkness, to those who are not enlightened by the power of the Spirit. But his coming shall not overtake the saints as a thief, for they know and understand the signs of the times. Let us here simply list some of the events which must occur between the first and second comings of our Lord by name. 1. There is to be an era of total apostasy from the truth. Universal spiritual darkness is to blanket the earth. 2. Then there is to be an age of restoration, a period in which God shall restore again all the saving truths ever revealed in any time or day. 3. In this period of restoration, the fullness of the everlasting gospel is to be given again to men on earth. 4. This restored gospel shall then be preached in all the world, in all nations, among every kindred and people before the Lord's return. 5. The promised restitution of all things is to include the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and its promulgation among all peoples. 6. The church and kingdom of God is to be set up again on earth in all its glory, beauty, and perfection. 7. Many of the scattered remnants of ancient Israel are to be gathered into the fold of Christ, come to the knowledge of their true Messiah, and be assembled again to the lands of their inheritance. That age, known as the times of the Gentiles, is to end, that is, the period of earth's history in which the gospel goes to the Gentiles on a preferential basis shall end. 9. Elijah is to come again, restoring the keys of the sealing power. 10. There is to be a messenger before the face of the Lord, preparing the way before him. 11. The Lord is to make various preliminary appearances in his temples. 12. Desolations evil abominations wars and signs both in heaven and on earth shall be shown forth including the sending again upon jerusalem of the abomination of desolation 13 many of the jews shall again be assembled in jerusalem their city of old 14 the lord will come to adam and diamond to receive a report from all those who have held the keys of his kingdom on earth and to take back from the ancient of days the keys and powers needed to reign personally on earth during the millennial reign 15. Then shall come the great and dreadful day, the day of vengeance and burning, the day when all nations shall be gathered at Armageddon, the day of the battle of that great day of God Almighty, the day when the vineyard shall be burned and every corruptible thing consumed, the day when peace and prosperity shall prevail for a thousand years. When shall this promised generation be? It is clear that nearly all of the foregoing has already transpired, and our revelation says, that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. True it is that the day and hour of our Lord's coming are and will remain unknown, such being an incentive to all to watch and be ready at all times. But true it also is that those who watch for that great and dreadful day are expected to read the signs of the times, so as to know the approximate time of his coming. President Wilford Woodruff taught that we do know the generation when he will come. President Wilford Woodruff said, But one thing is certain, though the Lord has not revealed the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man shall come, he has pointed out the generation, and the signs predicted as the forerunners of that great event have begun to appear in the heavens and on earth, and will continue until all is consummated. I was once praying very earnestly to know the time of the coming of the Son of Man, the Prophet Joseph Smith recorded on April 2, 1843. Four days later, April 6, 1843, at the General Conference of the Church, while the Spirit rested upon him, the prophet said, Were I going to prophesy, I would say the end would not come in 1844, 5, or 6, or in 40 years. There are those of the rising generation who shall not taste death till Christ comes. The rising generation is the one that has just begun. Thus, technically, children born on April 6, 1843, would be the first members of the rising generation, and all children born, however many years later, to the same parents, would still be members of that same rising generation. It is not unreasonable to suppose that many young men had babies at the time of this prophecy, and also had other children as much as 50 or 75 years later, assuming, for instance, that they were married again to younger women. 
this very probable assumption would bring the date up to, say, the second decade of the 20th century. And the children so born would be members of that same rising generation of which the prophet spoke. Now, if these children lived to the normal age of men generally, they would be alive well past the year 2000 AD. Reading these inspired statements in connection with the signs of the times which we can interpret, it is plain that the day of the coming of the Son of Man is not far distant. Elder Orson Pratt said, The day is at hand, the morning has broken, the sun of the gospel has arisen in the eastern horizon, and is beginning to shine with a degree of splendor. The time is near, how near no man knoweth, the day and the hour when the Son of Man shall come is a secret. In a revelation given to this church, it is said that no man shall know until he comes. Therefore, we cannot expect to know the day nor the hour, but we know it is near at hand. And what a consolation it is. There may be men that will know within a year, that will have revelation to say within a year or two when the Lord shall appear. I do not know that there is anything against this. Others have their eyes closed upon the prophecies of the ancient prophets, and not only that, but they are void of the spirit of prophecy themselves. When a man has this, though he may appeal to ancient prophets to get understanding on some subjects he does not clearly understand, yet as he has the spirit of prophecy in himself, he will not be in darkness. He will have a knowledge of the signs of the times. He will have a knowledge of the house of Israel and of Zion, of the ten tribes and of many things and purposes and events that are to take place on the earth, and he will see coming events, and can say, such an event will take place, and after that another, and then another, and after that the trump shall sound, and after that certain things will take place, and then another trump shall sound, etc., etc., and he will have his eye fixed on the signs of the times, and that day will not overtake him unawares, but upon the nations it will come as a thief. Today is day four for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 16th through the 22nd. First and second Thessalonians, perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Thursday, October 19th, 2023. First Thessalonians 5, 12 to 28 and second Thessalonians 1. Live as become the saints. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Paul's cry to the saints, as is that of every true minister, is always and everlastingly that they should keep the commandments and live as becometh those who have forsaken the world and taken upon them the name of Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12-13 And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Bishops and quorum and church officers in general should be esteemed highly for their ministerial labors. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 12-13, Paul encouraged the saints to know and esteem those who were over them in the Lord. Although in these verses Paul did not mention specific offices as he did in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, these teachings suggest that even at this early date, around 52 AD, there was some sort of a structure of church leadership. Some modern scholars suggest that the early church did not have any leadership hierarchy and that leadership structures developed much later, perhaps in the second century. It is possible, however, that the early branches of the church had a less formal leadership structure than the bishops, elders, and deacons described later in Paul's writings. This would parallel the early days of the Restoration when church leadership started with only a first and second elder, with the first presidency, quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and so on, developing later. Members of the church are to highly esteem the ecclesiastical leaders who preside over them. Criticism, fault-finding, backbiting, and gossip should be done away with, and an attitude of helpfulness, honest praise, kindness, and forbearance should prevail. The same respect and honor is to be given to all who labor to build up the kingdom. How is such honor for those who bear the priesthood to be obtained? For the men in the church, the following advice is of great value. If you will honor the holy priesthood in yourself first, you will honor it in those who preside over you and in those who administer in the various callings throughout the church. For the women of the church, 
A corollary is equally true. According to President Smith, if you will honor the holy priesthood in your husbands and fathers and sons, you will honor that priesthood and its callings in those who preside over you and in those who administer in the various callings throughout the church. As you review Paul's counsel in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14-25, invite each family member to find a phrase that the family could focus on. Find creative ways to display these phrases in your home as a reminder. For example, each person might find or draw pictures that illustrate or reinforce the phrase he or she chose. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort or exhort, console or encourage, the feeble-minded or faint-hearted and despondent, support or care for the weak or the informed, doubting or timid, be patient toward all men. The word feeble-minded is perhaps better written as faint-hearted. The admonition is to comfort those who lack courage or resolution to live the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Church officers are appointed to warn, comfort, support, teach, and help their brethren. Be faithful, stand in the office which I have appointed unto you, succor the weak, lift up the hands which hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-19 Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench or extinguish, hinder or suppress, not the Spirit. Elder Bruce McConkie, referring to quench not the Spirit, said, In the true church there will always be powerful manifestations of the Spirit of God. Inclinations to bridle and submerge these is of the world. Toward the end of 1 Thessalonians, Paul gave several items of practical counsel on how to prepare for the Lord's coming. As part of his counsel, Paul asked the saints to quench not the Spirit. To quench the Spirit means to extinguish or stifle the influence of the Holy Ghost in one's own life. Elder David A. Bednar pointed out that to fully enjoy the companionship of the Spirit, we must avoid activities that will drive the Spirit from us. If something we think, see, hear, or do distances us from the Holy Ghost, then we should stop thinking, seeing, hearing, or doing that thing. If that which is intended to entertain, for example, alienates us from the Holy Spirit, then certainly that type of entertainment is not for us, because the Spirit cannot abide that which is vulgar, crude, or immodest. Then clearly such things are not for us. Because we estrange the Spirit of the Lord when we engage in activities we know we should shun, then such things definitely are not for us. As we become ever more immersed in the Spirit of the Lord, we should strive to recognize impressions when they come and the influences or events that cause us to withdraw ourselves from the Holy Ghost. 1 Thessalonians 5.20 Despise not prophesyings Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to despise not prophesying, said, in the true church is found the gift of prophecy. Deny not the spirit of revelation, nor the spirit of prophecy. For woe unto him that denieth these things. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Prove or examine or put to the test all things. Hold fast that which is good. Paul invited the Thessalonian saints to test or prove all things, meaning to distinguish between good and evil and to hold fast that which is good. Teaching about what it means to hold fast that which is good, Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated, This exhortation was written by the Apostle Paul specifically to members of the church. He was speaking to people who had gained citizenship in the kingdom of God, who had come out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ, people such as we are supposed to be. He is not speaking to people of the world, but to the saints. It seems evident to me that the Apostle Paul was directing the members of the church to hold fast to the faith. He was saying, Cleave unto that which is good. Hold fast to the iron rod. Be valiant in testimony. Work out your salvation. That is, now that you are members of the church, that you have come in at the gate of repentance and baptism, 
Press forward to the end and do the things that will enable you to be saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Father. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Abstain from all appearance or kinds of evil. Paul taught the saints to abstain from all appearance of evil, or in other words, from all kinds of evil. Church officials have also used 1 Thessalonians 5.22 to teach that we should avoid appearing as though we are doing something evil. For example, President James E. Faust taught, I strongly urge you that if there is any question in your minds or hearts about whether your personal conduct is right or wrong, don't do it. It is the responsibility of the prophets of God to teach the word of God not to spell out every jot and tittle of human conduct. If we are conscientiously trying to avoid not only evil, but the very appearance of evil, we will act for ourselves and not be acted upon. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-28 And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all your brethren with an holy salutation. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Introduction to the Second Epistle of Paul, the Apostle to the Thessalonians. Why study 2 Thessalonians? In the second epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote words of counsel and clarification to members of the church who misunderstood certain aspects of the second coming of Jesus Christ. His teachings help modern readers understand the nature of the apostasy and how to prepare appropriately for the Lord's return. Who wrote 2 Thessalonians? As in 1 Thessalonians, the greeting in this epistle comes from Paul Silvanus or Silas, and Timotheus or Timothy, although the use of I throughout the letter suggests that Paul was the primary author. Some modern scholars have questioned whether Paul actually wrote both 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, pointing out perceived differences between the teachings in the two epistles. However, these differences may simply reflect the fact that 2 Thessalonians was written to respond to new erroneous claims being made in Thessalonica and to present additional insights not included in 1 Thessalonians. When and where was 2 Thessalonians written? This letter was probably written near the end of 52 AD, soon after Paul wrote his first letter to the Thessalonians. Most scholars believe that Paul and his companions wrote both 1 and 2 Thessalonians while the men were together in Corinth. Since the scriptures do not have any record of Paul, Silas, and Timothy being together after they each left Corinth. To whom was 2 Thessalonians written and why? The themes of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are similar, suggesting that Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians to clarify and expand on the first epistle. It is possible that his first letter did not resolve all the questions the Thessalonian saints had about the second coming. In addition, it appears that the Thessalonians had received a fraudulent letter that claimed to be from Paul, and this letter had caused some to believe that the second coming had already occurred. At the time Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians, he had also learned that the Thessalonian church members were experiencing increased persecution. Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians in order to strengthen the faith of these members and to correct doctrinal misunderstandings. What are some distinctive features of 2 Thessalonians? The second epistle of the Thessalonians provides significant details about the second coming of Jesus Christ that are not found in other biblical prophecies. Some examples include the ideas that the Lord will return in flaming fire, and that the wicked will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. In this epistle, Paul also prophesied of the great apostasy, teaching that the church would undergo a falling away prior to the second coming of the Lord. Paul's teachings about the apostasy remind modern church members why the Latter-day Restoration of the Gospel was necessary. Outline for 2 Thessalonians 1-3 through Paul corrected the false idea that the second coming had already occurred. He taught that there would be an apostasy prior to the Lord's return. He counseled church members to work to provide for their temporal needs and not to be weary in well-doing.
Now, to Bruce McConkie said, Paul here picks up again the main theme of his previous letter to his beloved Thessalonian friends, that of the second coming of the Son of Man. In pointed language, he reveals that there can be no return of the Lord Jesus until after the era of apostasy when the man of sin shall have control over all the earth. To this great gospel concept, he then adds his views on the gospel of work and some other practical Christian virtues. Ungodly Damned at Second Coming Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Justice demands both rewards and penalties. Thus, salvation and damnation both come from God. Blessings and cursings both flow from Him. If He rewards the righteous, He must punish the wicked. If he blesses those who suffer persecution for righteousness' sake, he must condemn those who act as the persecutors. 2 Thessalonians 1, 1 1-4 Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, the servants of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, unto the church of the Thessalonians, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet. Because of your faith growing exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience or endurance, and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Elder Bruce and McConkie, referring to the churches of God, said the congregations of God's people, comprising the church of Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the kingdom of God, said the celestial kingdom. 2 Thessalonians 1 6 through 8, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, Rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to in flaming fire, said, In that day the element shall melt with fervent heat. Since the contents of 2 Thessalonians are similar to 1 Thessalonians, it is likely that Paul received word that his first letter did not resolve all the questions the saints had regarding the second coming. Some of Paul's remarks at the beginning of this epistle also suggest that the Thessalonian saints were facing continued persecution. Paul spoke strongly about the church's persecutors, saying that they would be punished with everlasting destruction. The Joseph Smith translation changes the placement of the word everlasting in verse 9. Who shall be punished with destruction from the presence of the Lord? and from the glory of his everlasting power. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to destruction, said, Spiritual death, which is to be cast out of the presence of God, and to die as pertaining to things of righteousness. Speaking of wicked people who seek to destroy the tender testimonies of others, the Lord warned that it would be better for him to have a millstone, or large stone used to grind wheat, hung about their neck, and be drowned in the depths of the sea, than to face Christ at the day of judgment. Second Thessalonians one ten, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, "Our Lord's second coming will be a day of vengeance, burning, and destruction, a great and dreadful day, for the wicked, for those who rebel against his gospel." But for the righteous, it will be a day of redemption, blessing, and salvation, a glorious day of peace and righteousness. At that day, every corruptible thing shall be consumed, with those only who are worthy being able to abide the day. And in that day, his voice shall be heard, I have trodden the winepress alone, and have brought judgment upon all people, and none were with me. And I have trampled them in my fury, and I did tread upon them in mine anger. And their blood have I sprinkled upon my garments, and stained all my raiment. For this was the day of vengeance, which was in my heart. And now the year of my redeemed is come. And they shall mention the loving kindness of their Lord, and all that he has bestowed upon them according to his goodness, and according to his loving kindness for ever and ever. 
What additional truths do you learn from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, 5, 1 through 10, and 2 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 10? What are you prompted to do to watch and prepare for the Savior's coming? 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, Wherefore, also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Elder Bruce McConkey, referring to this calling, said, The saints are called to glory and honor, to be glorified in Christ at his coming, to inherit eternal life with him in his kingdom. 2 Thessalonians 1, 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is day five for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 16th through the 22nd. First and second Thessalonians, perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Friday, October 20th, 2023, second Thessalonians 2. Apostasy to precede second coming. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, in this previous epistle to the Thessalonians, Paul wrote of the times and seasons relative to the second coming. Our Lord's glorious return, he taught, was not destined to overtake the children of light as a thief in the night. They, as a woman in travail, would recognize the signs of the times. Now the apostle takes occasion to name one of these signs. It is that before our Lord's return, there was to be a falling away from the true faith. There was to be a universal apostasy a complete loss of that pure and perfect Christianity revealed by Jesus and the ancient apostles. In other words, between the first and second personal ministries of the Lord Jesus on planet Earth, the gospel was to be lost, darkness was to cover the earth, and Satan was to have control and dominion over the hearts and minds of men. Amid increasing persecutions, many Thessalonian saints believed the Savior's second coming must be near, but Paul knew that before Jesus returned to earth, there would be an apostasy, a rebellion or falling away from the truth. Under gospel topics, apostasy, it says, when individuals or groups of people turn away from the principles of the gospel, they are in a state of apostasy. One example is the great apostasy, which occurred after the Savior established his church. After the deaths of the Savior and his apostles, men corrupted the principles of the gospel and made unauthorized changes in church organization and priesthood ordinances. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-2 through 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by or concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, by letter except ye receive it from us, neither by spirit nor by word, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 suggest that some of the believers in Paul's day were alarmed or fearful that the Lord's second coming had already taken place. Their concerns may have resulted from doctrinal misunderstandings, or they may have been deceived by false teachings in a forged letter purportedly written by Paul. Paul cautioned the saints not to embrace information that church leaders had not previously taught. President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the continuing threat of deception in our day. There are some among us now who have not been regularly ordained by the heads of the church, who tell of impending political and economic chaos, the end of the world. They are misleading members. Those deceivers say that the brethren do not know what is going on in the world, or that the brethren approve of their teaching, but do not wish to speak of it over the pulpit. Neither is true. The brethren, by virtue of traveling constantly everywhere on earth, certainly know what is going on and by virtue of prophetic insight are able to read the signs of the times. Follow your leaders who have been duly ordained and have been publicly sustained, and you will not be led astray. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition.
beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. In order to calm the saints' concern that the Lord had already returned, Paul explained that before the second coming, there would be a falling away first. Falling away is a translation of the Greek word apostasia, a word that is closer in meaning to rebellion or mutiny. Paul was therefore speaking of an intentional fight against the gospel of Jesus Christ rather than a gradual movement away from it. In the Book of Mormon, Nephi's vision of the future taught him that the house of Israel joined with those in the great and spacious building to fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Apostasy is often not simply a passive letting go of truth, but an act of rebellion that originates within the covenant community. President James E. Faust spoke about how the apostasy was clearly foretold by New Testament apostles. Some of the early apostles knew that an apostasy would occur before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the Thessalonians, Paul wrote concerning this event, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. With this falling away, priesthood keys were lost, and some precious doctrines of the church organized by the Savior were changed. Among these were baptism by immersion, receiving the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands the nature of the Godhead, that they are three distinct personages. All mankind will be resurrected through the atonement of Christ, both the just and the unjust. Continuous revelation, that the heavens are not closed, and temple work for the living and the dead. The period that followed came to be known as the Dark Ages. This falling away was foreseen by the Apostle Peter, who declared that heaven must receive Jesus Christ until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Restitution would only be necessary if these precious things had been lost. The rapid process of apostasy commenced during the apostles' lifetimes. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught New Testament epistles clearly indicate that serious and widespread apostasy, not just sporadic dissent, began soon. James decried wars and fightings among the church. Paul lamented divisions in the church and how grievous wolves would not spare the flock. He knew an apostasy was coming and wrote to the Thessalonians that Jesus' second coming would not occur except there come a falling away first, further advising that iniquity doth already work. Near the end, Paul acknowledged how very extensive the falling away was. All they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Widespread fornication and idolatry brought apostolic alarm. John and Paul both demoned the rise of false apostles. The church was clearly under siege. Some not only fell away, but then openly opposed. In one circumstance, Paul stood alone and lamented that all men forsook me. He also decried those who subverted whole houses. Some local leaders rebelled, as when one who loved his preeminence refused to receive the brethren. No wonder President Brigham Young observed, it is said the priesthood was taken from the church, but it is not so. The church went from the priesthood. The concerns expressed by Peter, John, Paul, and James over the falling away were not paranoia, but prophetic warnings about apostasia. In addition to the falling away that would take place, Paul explained 
that the man of sin or son of perdition would be revealed prior to the Lord's second coming. The word perdition is derived from the Latin perditionum, meaning ruin or destruction. And it is a title given to Lucifer when he was cast out of God's presence during the premortal life. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to man of sin, said Lucifer is the man of sin, spoken of by Paul, who was to be revealed in the last days before the second coming of the Lord. He is the one of whom men shall say, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the houses of his prisoners? Joseph Smith, by revelation, inserted into Paul's account about the man of sin these words, He it is who now worketh, and Christ suffereth him to work, until the time is fulfilled that he shall be taken out of the way. That is, Satan was then committing havoc among men, and he would continue to do so until the ushering in of the millennial era when he would be bound. Satan and those with him who rebelled against God in heaven and were cast out were known as sons of perdition. These rebellious spirits chose evil by choice after having had the light. While dwelling in the presence of God, they knowingly entered into the rebellion. Their mission on earth is to attempt to destroy the souls of men and make them miserable as they themselves are miserable. The word perdition is derived from the Latin perditus, meaning to destroy, and was a title given to Satan. Therefore, in this passage, Paul refers to Satan. All those who rebelled with Satan against God during the premortal existence became sons of perdition when they were cast out of God's presence. Paul also described the man of sin one who possessed and exalted himself above all that is called God. The Joseph Smith translation makes clear that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-9, Paul was referring to Satan. With the restoration of the gospel and modern scriptures, an accurate understanding of the adversary has been restored. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said Paul's promise that the man of sin must be revealed before the Lord could return for the millennial era has been abundantly fulfilled. Lucifer's wicked plans, purposes, and works have been revealed and manifest from time to time, from the day of Paul to the present. At a conference of the church held June 3, 1831, the man of sin was revealed. It was in that some of the brethren were overcome by devils, whom the prophet rebuked and cast out. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4-7 Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, or to one who possesses, or holds to firm grasp, or restrains, that he might be revealed, or disclosed, discovered, or manifested in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, or lawlessness, doth already work. And he it is who now worketh, and Christ suffereth him to work, until the time is fulfilled, that he shall be taken out of the way. In Second Thessalonians 2, 7, Paul said that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In the New Testament, the word mystery refers to those things that were hidden, but have been or will be revealed. The hidden efforts of Satan to oppose and tear down the church of God, therefore, will be exposed by God's servants. Elder James E. Talmadge said, The seemingly obscure expression, He who now letteth will let, may be more readily understood by remembering that in the older style of English, let had the meaning of restrain or hinder. The passage, therefore, may be understood as a declaration that the spirit of iniquity was already active, though restrained or hindered for a time, and that later even this restraint would be removed and the evil one would be in power. In the Revised Version of the New Testament, this passage is rendered as thus. Lawlessness doth already work, only there is one that restraineth now, until he be taken out of the way. Just who or what is referred to as exercising a restraint on the powers of iniquity at that time has given rise to discussion. Some writers hold that the presence of the apostles operated in this way, while others believe that the restraining power of the Roman government is referred to. It is known that the Roman policy was to discountenance religious contention and to allow a large measure of liberty in forms of worship as long as the gods of Rome were not maligned, 
nor are their shrines dishonored. As Roman supremacy declined, the mystery of iniquity embodied in the apostate church operated practically without restraint. The expression mystery of iniquity, as used by Paul, is significant. Prominent among the early perverters of the Christian faith were those who assailed its simplicity and lack of exclusiveness. This simplicity was so different from the mysteries of Judaism and the mysterious rites of heathen idolatry as to be disappointing to many, and the earliest changes in the Christian form of worship were marked by the introduction of mystic ceremonies. According to the inspired version, the statement, until he be taken out of the way, refers to Satan, who was and still is causing misery, unhappiness, and sin throughout the world. He will continue to do so until he is bound by the Lord at the beginning of the millennium. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Revealed means manifested, and destroyed means cast out from the presence of the Lord, which is spiritual death or destruction. 2 Thessalonians 2 9. Yea, the Lord, even Jesus, whose coming is not until after there cometh a falling away by the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to all power and signs and lying wonders, said, Satan has power to imitate the truth, to lead men astray, to perform false miracles. The magicians in the court of Pharaoh imitated some of the miracles of Moses and Aaron. Satan has great power to produce false signs and wonders. He has the ability to imitate the miracles of God. Witness the efforts of the magicians in Pharaoh's court when they imitated the miracles of Moses and Aaron. Satan has power over the elements. He is a master of deceit. He can appear as an angel of light. He is an orator. He has the gift of tongues. Many are the powers of Satan, which he uses to lead men astray. Those spirits who followed Satan have these same capacities in lesser degrees. In all this, the power of the devil is limited, and the power of God is unlimited. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to all deceivableness of unrighteousness, said, All doctrines, views, philosophies, and concepts in whatever field which lead away from God and salvation in his kingdom. Second Thessalonians 2.11 And for this cause God shall send them strong illusion, that they should believe a lie. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to God shall send them strong delusion, said God shall permit them to believe false doctrines, as the vagaries of sectarianism, which say, for instance, that God is a spirit, that revelation and miracles have ceased, and that men are saved by lip service only without the works of righteousness. And referring to believe a lie, said believe false doctrines. God does not attempt to delude men, for he is a God of truth and cannot deceive. He does allow men to believe as they please. If they choose to accept untruth, he does not force them to think or do otherwise. President David O. McKay said, If man is to be rewarded for righteousness and punished for evil, then common justice demands that he be given the power to, of independent action. A knowledge of good and evil is essential to man's progress on earth. If we were coerced, to do right at all times, or were helplessly enticed to commit sin, he would merit neither a blessing for the first nor a punishment for the second. God is standing in the shadow of eternity, it seems to me, deploring the inevitable results of the follies, the transgressions, and the sins of his wayward children. But we cannot blame him for these any more than we can blame a father who might say to his son, There are two roads, my son, one leading to the right, one leading to the left. If you take the one to the right, it will lead you to success and to happiness. If you take the one to the left, it will bring you misery and unhappiness and perhaps death. But you choose which you will. You must choose. I will not force either upon you. So Paul is suggesting that God allows men to be deluded because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Second Thessalonians 2.12 
that they all might be damned or brought to account or trial, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In connection with his teachings about the deceptions of Satan, Paul taught that those who refuse to accept truth will eventually lose the opportunity to receive it, concerning those who receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Paul said that God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. This means that God will permit unbelievers to accept false doctrines and thereby forfeit their salvation. President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why periods of apostasy take place. Our Heavenly Father loves all of his children, and he wants them all to have the blessings of the gospel in their lives. Spiritual light is not lost because God turns his back on his children. Rather, spiritual darkness results when his children turn their collective backs on him. It is a natural consequence of bad choices made by individuals, communities, countries, and entire civilizations. You could deepen your understanding of the great apostasy and your appreciation of the restoration by pondering some of the following. Scriptures that foretold the apostasy. Isaiah 24, 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the law, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Amos 8, 11, and 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Matthew 24, 4-14 And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Second Timothy 4, 3-4 For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Scriptures that show the apostasy was already beginning in Paul's time. Acts twenty twenty eight to 30 Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Galatians 1, 6-7 I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. 1 Timothy 1, 5-7 Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jaggling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Observations about the Great Apostasy by Christian Reformers Martin Luther, I have sought nothing beyond reforming the Church in conformity with the Holy Scriptures. I simply say that Christianity has ceased to exist among those who should have preserved it. Roger Williams, The Apostasy 
has so far corrupted all that there can be no recovery out of that apostasy till Christ send forth new apostles to plant churches anew. Because of this widespread apostasy, the Lord withdrew the authority of the priesthood from the earth. This apostasy lasted until Heavenly Father and His beloved Son appeared to Joseph Smith in 1820 and initiated the restoration of the fullness of the gospel. Latter-day Saints believe that, through the priesthood conferred to Joseph Smith by ministering of angels, the authority to act in God's name was brought back to the earth. This is restored, not reformed, Christianity. Their belief in the restored Christianity helps explain why most Latter-day Saint converts from the 1830s to the present converted from their Christian denominations. None of these converts thought they were leaving Christianity. They were simply grateful to learn about and become a part of the restored Church of Jesus Christ, which they believe offers a more complete and rich Christian church, spiritually, organizationally, and doctrinally. During the Great Apostasy, people were without divine direction from living prophets. Many churches were established, but they did not have priesthood power to lead people to the true knowledge of God the Father and Jesus Christ. Parts of the Holy Scriptures were corrupted or lost, and no one had the authority to confer the gift of the Holy Ghost or perform their priesthood ordinances. We now live in a time when the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored. But unlike the church in times past, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will not be overcome by general apostasy. The Scriptures teach that the church will never again be destroyed. Although there will not be another general apostasy from the truth, we must each guard against personal apostasy by keeping covenants, obeying the commandments, following church leaders, partaking of the sacrament, and constantly strengthening our testimonies through daily scripture study, prayer, and service. See also 2 Nephi 28. Many false churches will be built up in the last days. They will teach false, vain, and foolish doctrines. Apostasy will abound because of false teachers. The devil will rage in the hearts of men. He will teach all manner of false doctrines. Gospel prepares men for eternal glory. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. While to Bruce R. McConkey, referring to God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, said, Members of the church were foreordained to be saved in the celestial kingdom. They were chosen in their preexistence to gain eternal life. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 Whereunto he called you by his gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkey, referring to obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, said, all who live the whole gospel law become sons of God and joint heirs with Christ. They inherit glory, power, might, and dominion with him. They become like him, and they have eternal life. His glory is their glory. Is it possible for anyone to obtain more than this? Second Thessalonians 2, 15-17 Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Elder Bruce McConkie said, Hence, keep the commandments. Today is day six for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 16th through the 22nd. First and Second Thessalonians, perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Saturday, October 21st, 2023. Second Thessalonians 3. Pray for triumph of gospel cause. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, How often Paul prays for the saints and implores them to unite their prayers for him and the cause. Prayer has a sanctifying effect. It unites the church and it causes the blessings of heaven to be poured out upon the heads of the saints. We should pray for the success and triumph of all the programs of the Lord's earthly kingdom, and we should then suit our actions to our words. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1-2 Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course, or may progress freely or rapidly, and be glorified even as it is with you. 
and that we may be delivered from unreasonable or unsuitable or absurd or improper and wicked men. For all men have not faith. Elder Bruce R. McConkey, referring to all men have not faith, said, Indeed, few men do, and without faith it is impossible to be saved. Second Thessalonians 3, 3-5 But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you, and keep you from evil, or the evil one, or the devil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf said, Without patience, we cannot please God. We cannot become perfect. Indeed, patience is a purifying process that refines understanding, deepens happiness, focuses action, and offers hope for peace. Patience is not passive resignation, nor is it failing to act because of our fears. Patience means active waiting and enduring. It means staying with something and doing all that we can, working, hoping, and exercising faith, bearing hardship with fortitude, even when the desires of our hearts are delayed. Patience is not simply enduring. It is enduring well. Saints withdraw fellowship from apostates. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, It is one thing to extend the hand of prospective fellowship to those who seek the truth and who are living according to to the best light and knowledge they have, but it is quite another to clasp an enemy to the bosom of the church. Public meetings, which are held before the world, are open to anyone. Non-members who are earnestly seeking the kingdom are welcome in sacrament meetings. However, those who have known the truth, who have rebelled and become enemies of the church, are in a different category. Those who sin and remain unrepentant are cast out of the church. Excommunicated and disfellowshipped persons have definite restrictions placed upon them. Even God cast one-third of the host of heaven out for rebellion. 2 Thessalonians 3.6 Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to the tradition which he received of us, said, The gospel, the teachings and doctrines, both oral and written, which he received from us. Paul taught that a church member who walked disorderly was not to enjoy full association with the church. Paul was specifically speaking about people who refused to work and support themselves. In our day, church members are encouraged not to associate with disorderly people who oppose the truth. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, Enemies from within, traitors to the cause, cultists, who pervert the doctrines and practices which lead to salvation, often draw others away with them, and added souls lose their anticipated inheritance in the heavenly kingdom. When cultists and enemies become fixed in their opposition to the church, and when they seek to convert others to their divisive positions, the course of wisdom is to avoid them, as Paul here directs, and to leave them in the Lord's hands. Paul preacheth the gospel of work. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Temporal work is essential to salvation. Man cannot be saved in idleness. It is not enough simply to believe the great spiritual realities. We could do that as spirits in pre-existence. But we are now placed on a temporal earth to gain the experiences of mortality with the command, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. Work as such is an essential part of eternal progression. Hence the idler shall be had in remembrance before the Lord. And the idler shall not have place in the church, except to repent and mend his ways. Second Thessalonians 3, 7-9 through 9. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow or imitate us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, or undeservedly, or gratuitously. But wrought with labor, and travailed night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you not because we have not power or authority, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. 
Dr. Bruce R. McConkie said even Paul and his ministerial associates, who were in fact entitled to temporal help from the saints, chose to set an example of self-support. There are perils in a paid ministry. Of the elders of the church in general, the Lord says, Let the residue of the elders watch over the churches and declare the word in the regions round about them, and let them labor with their own hands, that there be no idolatry nor wickedness practiced. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should ye eat. Be not weary in well-doing. Elder Brewster McConkie said the saints are expected to try and better their circumstances in temporal and spiritual matters, in social and governmental affairs, and in all things. Initiative in choosing and advocating proper causes is essential to salvation. It is not meet that I should command in all things, the Lord says, for he that is compelled in all things, the same is a slothful and not a wise servant. Wherefore, he receiveth no reward. Verily I say, men should be anxiously engaged in a good cause, and do many things of their own free will, and bring to pass much righteousness. For the power is in them, wherein they are agents unto themselves, and inasmuch as men do good, they shall in no wise lose the reward. But he that doeth not anything until he is commanded, and receiveth the commandment with doubtful heart, and keepeth it with slothfulness, the same is damned. Second Thessalonians three, eleven through twelve. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, Work is a commandment of the Lord. Thou shalt not be idle, for he that is idle shall not eat the bread nor wear the garments of the laborer. Second Thessalonians 3.13 But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. D&C 64.33-34 Wherefore, be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days. Do we ever feel weary in well-doing, overwhelmed perhaps with the demands of discipleship? What helps us when we feel this way? Galatians 6, 9 And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Doctrine and Covenants 64, 33 Wherefore, be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. How can we support each other when this happens? 2 Thessalonians 3, 14-16 And if any man obeyed not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. President David O. McKay said the peace of Christ does not come by seeking the superficial things of life. Neither does it come except as it springs from the individual's heart. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Thus the Son of Man, the executor of his own will and testament, gave to his disciples and to mankind the first of all human blessings. It was a bequest conditioned upon obedience to the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is thus bequeathed. To each individual, no man is at peace with himself, who transgresses the law of right, either in dealing with himself by indulging in passion and appetite, yielding to temptations against his accusing conscience, or in dealing with his fellow men, being untrue to their trust. Peace does not come to the transgressor of law. Peace comes by the obedience to law, and it is that message that Jesus would have us proclaim among men. 2 Thessalonians 3, 
the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token of every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Sometimes there are people who have great fears about the second coming of the Lord. They are heard to say, There are so many terrible events prophesied. I hope I die before the Lord comes again. Are such feelings justified? Is there any hope for the righteous who may live to see the second coming? Those who follow the prophet need not fear. President Ezra Taft Benson said, My text today is from a revelation of the Lord to Joseph Smith the prophet at a conference of the church January 2nd, 1831, as follows. If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. In section 1 of the Great Doctrine and Covenants, a volume of modern scripture, we read these words. Prepare ye, prepare ye for that which is to come. Further in this same revelation are these warning words. I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth. What are some of the calamities for which we are to prepare? In section 29, the Lord warns us of a great hailstorm sent forth to destroy the crops of the earth. In section 45, we read of an overflowing scourge, for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. In section 63, the Lord declares he has decreed wars upon the face of the earth. In Matthew chapter 24, we learn of famines and pestilences and earthquakes. The Lord declared that these and other calamities shall occur. These particular prophecies seem not to be conditional. The Lord, with his foreknowledge, knows that they will happen. Some will come about through man's manipulations, others through the forces of nature and nature's God, but that they will come seems certain. Prophecy is but history in reverse, a divine disclosure of future events. Yet through all of this, the Lord Jesus Christ has said, If ye are prepared, ye shall not fear. What, then, is the Lord's way to help us prepare for these calamities? The answer is also found in section 1 of the Doctrine and Covenants, wherein he says, Wherefore I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments, and also gave commandments to others. He has also said, Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall be fulfilled. Here then is the key. Look to the prophets for the words of God that will show us how to prepare for the calamities which are to come. For the Lord in that same section states, What I the Lord have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. Again the Lord warned those who will reject the inspired words of his representatives in these words, And the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. Our only safety is obedience. President Harold B. Lee said, now the only safety we have as members of this church is to do exactly what the Lord said to the church in that day when the church was organized. We must learn to give heed to the words and commandments that the Lord shall give through his prophet. As he received them, walking in all holiness before me, as if from mine own voice, in all patience and faith. There will be some things that take patience and faith. You may not like what comes from the authority of the church. It may contradict your political views. It may contradict your social views. It may intervene with some of your social life. But if you listen to these things, as if from the mouth of the Lord himself, with patience and faith, the promise is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you, and cause the heavens to shake for your good and his name's glory. What does giving heed to the living prophets mean? Does it simply mean doing what they say when calamity strike? Only the spiritually prepared shall endure without fear in the days ahead. The general authorities of the church give much counsel that while not directly related to preparing for calamities is directly related to spirituality. Evaluate honestly in your own heart the following questions. Do you accept and follow the counsel of living prophets?
Does this acceptance apply to such things as the dating, dress, and moral codes, as well as doctrinal teachings? Though such decisions may yet be future, have you already firmly determined that you will heed the counsel of the prophets about working mothers, the limiting of family size for reasons of convenience, education, or increased income, or other counsel that, at times, causes some of the young members of the church to murmur? The present-day welfare program is one way to be prepared. President Ezra Taft Benson said, for the righteous, the gospel provides a warning before a calamity, a program for the crisis, a refuge for the disaster. The Lord has said that the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, but he assures us that he that is tithed shall not be burned. The Lord has warned us of famines, but the righteous will have listened to prophets and stored at least a year's supply of survival food. The Lord has set loose the angels to reap down the earth. But those who obey the word of wisdom, along with the other commandments, are assured that the destroying angel shall pass by them, as the children of Israel, and not slay them. The Lord desires his saints to be free and independent in the critical days ahead. But no man is truly free who is in financial bondage. Think what you do when you run in debt, said Benjamin Franklin. You give another power over your liberty. Pay thy debt and live, said Elisha. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says, It is my will that you should pay all your debts. From the standpoint of food production, storage, handling, and the Lord's counsel, wheat should have high priority. Water, of course, is essential. Other basics could include honey and sugar, legumes, milk products and substitutes, and salt and its equivalent. The revelation to store food may be as essential to your temporal salvation today as boarding the ark was to the people in the days of Noah. President Harold B. Lee has wisely counseled that perhaps if we think not in terms of a year's supply of what we ordinarily use, and think more in terms of what it would take to keep us alive in case we didn't have anything else to eat, that last would be very easy to put in storage for a year, just enough to keep us alive if we didn't have anything else to eat. We wouldn't get fat on it, but we would live. And if you think in terms of that kind of annual storage rather than a whole year's supply of everything that you are accustomed to eat, which in most cases is utterly impossible for the average family, I think we will come nearer to what President Clark advised us way back in 1937. There are blessings in being close to the soil in raising your own food, even if it is only a garden in your yard and or a fruit tree or two. Man's material wealth basically springs from the land and other natural resources. Combined with his human energy and multiplied by his tools, his wealth is assured and expanded through freedom and righteousness. Those families will be fortunate who in the last days have an adequate supply of each of these particulars. Some young adult members of the church may not be in a position as yet to implement fully Elder Benson's suggestions. Even so, consider the following in determining what can be done to prepare yourself. If you are single or even newly married, it is unlikely that you have the means for purchasing and storing a year's supply of food. But are you doing all that is possible for you to do in your present situation? Have you encouraged your family to prepare themselves and helped them to do so? What place on the priority list will food storage take for you in the near future? Is there any plot of land, however small, available to you for the planting of vegetables or fruit? Debt and living within one's income are things that you can directly control. Are you free from debt? If not, is becoming so one of the important goals of your life? Do you rationalize your indebtedness by insisting that you must have a nicer mode of transportation, a more luxurious place to live, or various recreational equipment? Have you determined that when you are married, debt shall be incurred only 
or necessities that cannot be obtained otherwise. Are you committed to the idea that unresolved debts are just another form of theft? Even though these concerns may be somewhat removed from you at this stage in your life, there are other steps of temporal preparation that you can take. It is said that today's generation lives in the knowledge explosion. There is hardly any basic skill that cannot be studied in readily available books or learned in classes held around us. Sewing skills, cooking and dietary knowledge, basic mechanical abilities, farming know-how, all of these can be learned and will be invaluable to you and those around you in times of crisis and shortage. You need not wait for marriage or economic independence to gain these priceless assets. And imagine the self-satisfaction that you would feel if you could say in time of crisis, even though I was not able to collect a complete food supply, I have the knowledge to produce food. Even though I have little in terms of temporal goods, I have skills and abilities to contribute to the common cause. What will your decision be? Will you follow the counsel of God's prophets and thus become a child of light? 